This uh, very short wrap-up video is just going to talk a little bit about fluid balance, electrolytes, and ABGs. You have a much more in-depth, longer voiceover PowerPoint within your modules that you can watch for uh, more in-depth um, kind of uh, description and discussion. So, you know, we talk about types of imbalances. We have fluid volume deficit and fluid volume excess. And so you're going to see this throughout the semester. So you're going to want to make sure that this is our terms that you understand. So for fluid volume deficit, there's been an abnormal loss. So the person is losing fluids. And then you want to think about what kind of assessments would you uh, expect. So if someone has fluid loss, you're going to have you know, uh, decreased blood pressure, um, decreased urine output, decreased skin turgor, their skin may appear dry, and um, prolonged or uh, severe hypovolemia can result in hypovolemic shock. Fluid volume excess, um, you know, the person has increased fluids, so they may have edema, crackles in their lungs, um, increased blood pressure, bounding pulse, so, you know, anything that can cause excess fluid volume could be related to heart failure exacerbations, kidney failure, um, excessive IV infusion of fluids, or if maybe somebody's getting blood at a fast rate. So these are things that you're going to carry through the rest of the semester as we're assessing our patients to be watching for fluid volume deficit and fluid volume excess. When we think about some of the electrolytes, uh, you know, for example, here we have hypernatremia. You can see there's so many causes and so many different manifestations and treatments. So you really want to try to get your head around, um, you know, the kind of the main causes of what do we think is, is doing this. And so, you know, you could see really it's where, you know, you have kind of an imbalance of how much is being taken in or, or how fluid is being lost and how it's being lost. So. For example, with hyperglycemia, you know, you're going to have excess, excessive uh, urine output, polyuria. So thinking about where the fluid is coming in and how the fluid is going out and how that impacts your sodium. And really with sodium imbalances, we have a lot of problems neurologically. So because you have the dehydration of those brain cells, this is where you're going to see confusion, agitation, and in severe cases can result in seizure and coma. So really, um, you know, the big treatment for this is going to be to restrict the sodium intake. Um, and in some cases, it might be to be to flu push fluids. The big thing to remember is, though, is that whether we're trying to increase or decrease the sodium, we have to do it slowly or it can cause cerebral edema and long-term cognitive defects. When we have the patient now who has low sodium, same thing, we have to kind of adjust it slowly for the same reasons and we also now still have some of those neurological deficits we're seeing because now the brain cells are being uh, filled with fluid so uh, sodium is probably one of the most that's one of the ones that's most confusing because it really gets very specific on how the fluid is retained or lost but with hyponatremia the big thing is fluid restriction so we're gonna restrict their fluids and um, put them on a fluid restriction and slowly increase those sodium levels. In very severe cases, you might see someone getting 3% sodium chloride, but that person would be in an ICU. Because if you think about what um, the concentration of IV fluids that we're normally giving to someone, it's 0 0.9. So this is extremely concentrated. This person would have to be very closely monitored in an ICU setting. Now potassium, um, in my opinion, is one of the most important electrolytes. Um, other people might feel otherwise, but I have cardiac, I'm a cardiac nurse by background, so to me this is extremely important. And um, I always try to remember that K kills. So your potassium, if it's too low or too high, can kill you. And it's a small range. You know, you have this 3.5 to 5, that's a small range. That's a much smaller range than when you think about sodium, when you're, you know, you have a 10 point span that um, sodium can change. So a lot of times our potassium is high for, you know, renal failure problems, excessive intake, or some medications can cause it as well. 
And some of the manifestations, again, are similar when you're talking about hypo or hyperkalemia, so that can be confusing. But one of the things we're really worried about here are these dysrhythmias and the lethal dysrhythmias. So we really have to work to get our potassium levels down to a normal range if they are too high. So some of the, um, you know, the quick treatments if we need to is going to be this one here where we have IV insulin followed by IV glucose. That's going to help force the fluid from extra, force the potassium from extracellular to intracellular. That's what the insulin is going to do. And then we have to follow that insulin by glucose or we're going to bottom out that patient. Another medication, if the potassium is really high, will be that IV calcium gluconate. And that is really to help decrease the excitability of the cardiac muscle. It does not bring down the potassium, but it's going to help prevent that patient from having the V-fib or the VTAC, which again are lethal and then what can kill you. Hypokalemia also um, very dangerous because again, we can have those lethal ventricular dysrhythmias, the VTAC and the VFib. So hypokalemia a lot of times is happening from an excessive loss, whether the person has severe diarrhea, vomiting, um, some other medications. So when we think about loop diuretics and thiazide diuretics, the patient should always be on a potassium chloride supplement. So uh, potassium and those kind of diuretics, I would consider them as married. They should always be together. Um, uh, you also have uh, metabolic acidosis, which can happen, and then treatment of DKA. So when we think about the treatment of DKA, the person is getting insulin. And we just talked about on the last slide, if you're getting insulin, it forces the K from extracellular to intracellular, so it can cause the potassium levels to decrease. So we're really watching our potassium levels for someone who's on an insulin infusion. So, uh, you know, to get this potassium level up, we're going to be supplementing them. It may be oral, it may be IV, um, but something to remember is we never give potassium too fast. Potassium too fast can kill your patient as well. So it's always given at um, a slower rate and can take hours for potassium to give in, to get into the patient. Never given IV push. And a pa patient who has potassium imbalances, whether high or low, they must be monitored on telemetry because of these lethal dysrhythmias. Hypercalcemia, uh, again, can impact the excitability of the muscles and the nerves, so you can see some um, dysrhythmias there as well. Typically, calcium doesn't uh, change as much as potassium would, so you wouldn't see some of those um, changes in dysrhythmias, like changes in uh, normal rhythm like you would, but you can also see some neurological changes. So you might see some cardiac, you might see some neuro neurological changes, and you know we're gonna wanna get rid of this calcium. So we can, if it's not very severe, you know, a low calcium diet, but if we really need to get that calcium down, we're gonna promote it by um, giving IV fluids followed by a diuretic to help promote promote the excretion of the calcium through your urine. If calcium is low, again, we can see some nerve excitability. We can see some ventricular tachycardia. So here we want to make sure that we are increasing those calcium levels, and that can be done by um, oral intake, calcium supplements, and in severe cases we can give calcium gluconate, which will increase the calcium level, but will also help prevent those dysrhythmias. So you're going to want to make sure you know about the Chvatsiks and the Trousseau signs. Those are simple assessments that nurses can do to look at, um, to kind of assess whether a patient might be hypocalcemic. Of course, we would follow that up with uh, a blood test to confirm, but if you have patients having any of these kind of signs and symptoms, that is a trigger to you to maybe see about getting a calcium level drawn if they don't have one drawn already, or to assess what their labs were that day. High and low phosphorus, again, not going to be, uh, not usually going to have such acute manifestations like you would with, uh, we'll say, potassium, but you can have more long-term problems if you have high phosphorus levels, and you can see a lot of times one of the big culprit is going to be if they're having any renal failure because phosphorus, like potassium, is excreted in your urine. 
So some more long-term effects can be these calcified deposits that you can find um, in the skin, the arteries, kidneys, corneas. So, um, you know, hydration will help with that. Limiting their dietary intake will also be helpful as well. And um, phosphorus and calcium have an inverse relationship. So if someone is having low calcium levels, you're gonna see higher uh, phosphorus levels. So help balancing that out will help correct that imbalance as well. Low phosphorus levels a lot of times has to do with malnourishment or malabsorption. And oftentimes symptoms are very symptomatic. But in um, someone who has severely low phosphorus and usually over more of a long period of time, you may begin to see some of those neurological deficits again, muscle weakness, muscle pain, and uh, there is that risk for dysrhythmias. So again here, our main treatment is more likely gonna be these oral treatments, increasing their oral intake. Um, but in severe cases, we can give IV phosphorus. And um, there is a combination where it also comes with either sodium or potassium. So you would, the provider would be looking at what other deficit that patient might be having. And if they have both low phosphorus and low potassium, they would choose the potassium phosphate. Um, if it's someone who has low sodium or maybe they have a high potassium and we don't want to give extra potassium, then they would choose, this, choose the sodium phosphate. Again here, because of that inverse relationship with calcium, we're going to be monitoring for um, calcium levels as well. Because when we treat this now, because like I said, we have that inverse relationship. When we start to treat the phosphorus level, uh, we can then impact the calcium level. So magnesium, another one very important for cardiac health is magnesium. Again, high magnesium often results from reasons uh, either excessive intake or something that's um, in inhibiting the ability for your body to excrete the magnesium, which a lot of times is that kidney failure. So they're holding on to that magnesium similar to like that potassium. So we can see some neurological effects, but we really are worried about, again, those dysrhythmias. So to treat it, um, to get those magnesium levels down, we can, uh, again, give diuretics, if not contraindicated. If it's a dialysis patient, maybe they need dialysis. We can give calcium gluconate or calcium chloride again, but remember, all that does is kind of prevent the heart from going into those lethal dysrhythmias. It doesn't bring down the magnesium, but it'll help prevent the patient from going into VFib or VTAC. So fluids, diuretics, dialysis are kind of the key treatment for getting those high magnesium levels down. Um, low magnesium, again, typically is happening from patients not getting it in their diet or having absorption problems, or that pesky diuretic, again, um, can cause you to lose your magnesium similar to it would with your potassium. So magnesium, if low, again, neurological defects and dysrhythmias. So easy way to get that up is gonna to be to increase the dietary intake, give them some oral supplements, and we can um, give it IV as well if needed. It's gonna be given slow as well, like potassium, because we don't want to cause cardiac arrest. So, you know, there are so many things to think about when we have electrolytes. So it's kind of have to just try to group them together and think about some of the most important things because you can see many of them can cause dysrhythmias and many of them can cause neurological deficits. So you want to kind of think when you have exam questions, thinking about how do, what's impacting this? Are we talking about a cardiac patient who's likely getting diuretics and we're seeing now these signs and symptoms? what might be our treatment. So kind of trying to differentiate the different electrolyte imbalances, but then also thinking of them a little bit holistically. A big thing to remember now is how potassium and magnesium impact the heart. So although your magnesium levels, when you look at your need to know lab values, might say potassium is normal from 3.5 to 5, and magnesium 1.3 to 2.1. When we have a cardiac patient or anyone coming in with any type of cardiac symptoms, cardiac history, we really wanna keep these 
potassium levels closer to four and magnesium levels closer to 1.8 or even two, depending on your hospital policy. So um, check it out the next time you're at clinical to see what does your policy say, because these patients who are at risk for any type of dysrhythmia um, really should be having supplements to keep them closer to this level, because anybody with a cardiac history, um, anybody who's come in um, with any type of illness um, or procedure that could impact their cardiac functioning, we wanna keep these electrolytes much, much closer to the potassium level of four and your magnesium level of 1.8. Regarding uh, your ABGs, you will need to have this memorized, so you're gonna to wanna to know how to interpret ABGs for your exam. So you have kind of this little chart here, if this is helpful. Also using the Rome mnemonic to help you um, figure out your ABGs. But things you're gonna to wanna to think about when you're studying for the exams and thinking about your patients is you know, you not only need to know how to interpret your ABGs, so if you went through and interpreted this one, you would have that the patient is in respiratory acidosis. You might have questions asking you, um, you know, what could be a possible cause of someone in respiratory acidosis? So somebody who had hypoventilation issues, someone with COPD, a patient with pneumonia. And then you'd have to think about um, if the patient is compensating, you know, how are they compensating? So in this one, we can see by our elevated bicarb levels that the kidneys have been to begin to have started to conserve the bicarb right, to help with that. And so you have to think also then, what might be some interventions that you as a nurse could do for this patient? So for this one, it might be that you're increasing um, their respiratory rate, providing oxy oxygenation. In severe cases, they might need to be ventilated. So when you think about ABGs, it's not just about memorizing um, how to interpret the ABG, but to think about what could be the causes if the patient was compensating, what signs and symptoms would you would you see, or what lab values might you see, and what would be the interventions you as the nurse would be expected to do? So again, you have longer, more detailed uh, PowerPoints uh, in your course module, but hopefully this will help give you kind of a quick snippet of things, uh, kind of key concepts regarding these topics. Thank you.